Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about circular saws, and we'd like to thank Dave the Nerd for liking and sharing the podcast. And we'd also like to thank Thumbtack.com for sponsoring this week's episode. Some of the earliest evidence of saws are drawings in Egypt going back to about 1500 BC. What kind and of saws? They were using copper hand saws. And then it wasn't, so from 1500 to to BC, it wasn't until 1923 (laughs) where we had the first motorized machete that was invented and the gentleman used a malted milk mixer motor to create the motorized machete. Wow, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? (laughs) Easy for me to say. And then Joseph Sullivan heard about this, and he created the first portable circular saw in 1924, hmm. and he's he started the Skill Company oh. in 1926, so Skill is S-K-I-L. And they're still around today. Yeah, and, and still some of the top-rated circular saws you can get. 1937, they came out with their Worm Drive Model 77. Mm-hmm. It had the first circular saw with a 7 and a quarter inch blade. And they're still making that model? (laughs) Wild, huh? Circular saw is just a great basic tool for cutting through lumber like 2x4s and 2x6s and sheet material like plywood. Can you use it for anything else? So you can get different blades. You can get a blade for cutting through bricks or concrete. You can get blades for plastic. Yes, metal. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, you can do a lot with a circular saw, and a lot of it depends on the blade that Mm -hmm. you're using. And there's two there's two common styles. One is a sidewinder, and the other one is a worm drive. And with a sidewinder, if you're holding on to the handle of your sidewinder circular saw, you're going to have the motor on the left, and your saw blade is going to be on the right. Who came and, up with a name for this? Yeah, well, well, because the spur gears are lined up, and it's in line with the blade. And this is going to generate very fast speeds with the blades, usually around 6,000 RPMs. Okay. And then for a sidewinder, there's also a left-handed version. So with this, if you're holding it with your right hand, the blade is going to be on the left. So and on a circular saw, it's going to say sidewinder? No. Or they're, they're, you're just going it's, it's, to... Is it a slang term? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> Somebody should coin that. That's a great name. Another million dollar idea right there. But with us, we should look that up. I I don't even know. I wonder if there's a manufacturer that calls it the Sidewinder. Did you have a point with bringing up the left-handed? So some varieties like a left-handed circular saw because they find it easier to see the line that they draw on their material. Okay. And so then you with, actually hold this in the store, like pick it up and... Yeah, because they vary in weight. And imagine and, and, yourself and, cutting through stuff. Yeah. And the handles, it, there's a lot of different positions, So and it's safer if you're always using two hands on this. Right. So it's definitely worth picking it up, feeling it, especially like with a worm drive. So this is the other style of circular saw. This, so again, this is a slang term? Yes, worm drive. Well, it's, it's the type of gear that it's using. So this uses... But, so is it going to say it on the package? Worm drive? This might, yeah. Well, a worm drive will probably say it on the package where a sidewinder probably won't. But a worm drive has a screw-like gear, and this transfers the power to the blade. It actually changes the direction of the force, huh. so it's going to be a little slower speed for the blade, usually around 4,500 RPMs. But a worm drive is going to generate a lot more torque. So a worm drive is going to go through wet or hard material with less chance of a kickback. Hmm. And the, a lot of the pros really like the worm drive. They're usually heavier, though, and a little more expensive. And what's interesting about a worm drive is they need oil for the gears. Really? Yeah. So this is something that you're going to have to do maintenance with. Where what a, kind of oil? A, a regular worm drive oil. <laughs> <laughs> where sidewinders don't need oil. Huh. And with the worm drive, I don't know whether I said it or not, but you generally have the motor at the back of the saw, or it's going to be slightly off to the right, and the blade is going to be on the left, where a standard sidewinder, the blade is on the right. Craziness. You know what's interesting about gears? They go back to about 2600 BC, and the Romans had gears to measure the speed of their chariots. Okay. Wild, huh? Yes. Thank <laughs> you for that information, JC. <laughs> In the U.S., you're going to find the Sidewinder style most popular in the Midwest and the East Coast, and the Worm Drive is more popular on the West Coast. Wow, that seems crazy. Which is interesting, isn't it? 
Many have of the, you ever used a worm drive? You know, I tried one on the job site, and it was really heavy compared to what I was used to with the Sidewinders. And also the style I tried it at the motor in the back, and the second handle was in front and off to the right. And so I actually had to reach over hmm. to hold it. And for me, it just seemed very awkward. But a lot of the pros are saying it's easier to see the cut line with a worm drive. Interesting. All circular saws are going to have a spring-loaded blade cover, and this is designed to be pushed out of the way by the material you're cutting through. So as you're pushing into your work, it pushes this back. Once you cut through your material, it's going to spring back over the blade. So if you set it down, you're not going to damage the flooring. That's smart. But it's a good habit to get into to wait till the blade stops before you set it down. Because <laughs> if you're working on a big project and you get a lot of sawdust or chips in there, right. that blade cover can get hung up. Hmm. On that blade cover, there's going to be a lever. So if you want to do a plunge cut into what material. So if you had a sheet of plywood and you want to cut in the center of it, rather than starting from the end, you can get your saw up to speed, lift that cover with the lever, mm -hmm. and then you can drop it right down into your plywood. And the way you'd want to do a plunge cut is rest the bottom of the shoe or the base of it of the circular saw, and that's what you're gliding over the top of your material with. Right. You're going to put the front of it onto the material where the blade's not touching. You're going to lift up that cover. You can turn your trigger on, let your blade get up to speed, and then you're going to slowly oh. drop it into the material, then let go of the lever, and then the material will hold that. And yeah. that way you can cut in the center of material. And again, I would let the blade release your trigger, let the blade stop before you lift it out of a sheet. <laughs> One feature available in saws is a break. So when you release the trigger, it stops the blade. So this is a great safety if you overreach or you lose control, if you're doing plunge cuts. All right. And the pros really like it because it allows them to get ready for the next cut much quicker, so it's going to save them time and energy. When you're setting up your blade to cut through material, you want to adjust that bottom plate. And again, some people call it a shoe or a base. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a lever adjustment, and you want to change the depth of that blade so it extends just below the material about an eighth of an inch, no more than a quarter inch. Okay. And that's going to give you much more control, less chance of kickback. And some saws are actually going to have a gauge for thickness hmm. on the back of the saw. But the easiest is, is to just look at it, set it next to the material, yeah. and you want it about an eighth of an inch past the bottom. Okay. For straight cuts through your work, you're going to rest the front of the shoe on the material with the blade not touching, and you're going to have a notch on the front of the shoe that you're going to line up with your cut line that okay. you drew on your material. And most shoes are going to have two notches, one for zero and one for 45. You're going to turn on the saw, let the blade get up to speed, and mm -hmm. then you're going to slowly guide it down your cut line. Okay. When you're making your mark on your material with your pencil, know what side of the line you want to cut on. So I usually measure on the good side, so the side I want to keep. I'm going to make my pencil mark, and then I'm going to line up my saw and cut up to that line on the waist side, so the side that I'm throwing out. Right. And then I want to leave my pencil mark. That way I can follow right down that pencil mark, because mm -hmm. if I cut through the pencil mark, Right. De depending on how accurate I need to be on my cut, you know, you can you can alter by quite a bit. Right. So I like using using the pencil line and leaving it and cutting right up to it. Mm -hmm. For the most control over your saw, you want to cut so the widest part of the shoe and the side with the motor is on the side of the work that's supported, and then the waist is going to be dropping away. Mm -hmm. And the more you can support the work, the the better it is. You're going to get a cleaner cut. When work falls away, it can actually splinter and tear. Right. So the best way to do it is to have a sacrificial piece of wood or support lumber under it. So let's say you're cutting on top of a, a sheet of plywood, uh, you know, a sacrificial piece of plywood. You have your work on top of this plywood. You're cutting through the work an eighth of an inch, and you're actually cutting into that plywood below it an eighth of an inch. But when you cut through your material, nothing falls away. Oh. It's all supported. Another thing you can do is you can use sawhorses and have multiple 2x4s laying across them. Mm -hmm. Lay your work on this, clamp your work to it, and then you're going to cut into those 2x4s, but it's going to keep it and support it from falling away, oh. and that way you're going to get a very clean cut. And another thing with the sawhorses, you never want to cut unsupported wood between them because it's going to bind and cause kickback and you're going to damage your work. For professional cuts, you can use the fence that comes with most saws. What is that? So this is like a T-bar that extends off the shoe, 
and it adjusts to different widths hmm. and this catches on the side of let's say you're cutting a piece of uh, plywood it's going to catch along the edge of it and now this allows you to use this as a guide oh, to nice. follow a line so you can adjust it to match your line and just go straight down the edge hmm. you can also make your own you can create a wood fence or your own jigs to create a wood fence you can use a thin smooth plywood about a quarter of an inch and this is what your shoe is going to ride on and then use a piece of half inch plywood for the edge of it so this is what the saw is going to be bumping against to use as a guide okay and you want to use the finished edge on this plywood you're going to glue or glue and screw that half inch piece on top of the quarter inch piece and then you're going to make this about 12 inches wide, the bottom part. Hmm. You're going to put your half inch piece on top of it, glue it to it, and then you're going to ride your circular saw up against that half inch piece all the way down, and it's going to cut away perfectly the width of the saw, the, the shoe. Right. And now you can line this up against your cut lines, and now you're going to be running your saw against this piece of plywood. Oh, that's smart. And you can make this four feet long or eight feet long mm -hmm. and just Google this, you know, making your own <laughs> circular saw wood Wait, fence. Video. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's really easy way to get very professional cuts and, and very expensive couple pieces of plywood. So Bench Dog has saw guides and different types of clamps and Craig, K-R-E-G. They have really nice cut guides that you can add on to your circular saw. Hmm. So instead of making one, you can just buy one and just Go the easy route. attach it to it. <laughs> and it does a really nice job for long, straight <laughs> cuts. A couple of nice tools to have when you're working with a circular saw is a speed square or a drywall tee for making your lines. And then a speed square, either clamped or held against your wood, makes a really nice guide to run your saw up against for like 2x4s and 2x6s. Mm -hmm. Although the safest is to always have both hands on your saw when you're using it. So clamp it. <laughs> yes. We'd like to thank Thumbtack.com for sponsoring this week's podcast. And their website is T-H-U-M-B-T-A-C-K.com. And you can hire a pro for any project around right. the house, which is pretty amazing. And it's free, mm -hmm. and it's very easy and fast to fill out these forms right. to hire somebody. They have over a 1,000 different services. And it's not just home improvement. No. So a lot of home yeah, improvement. Yeah. Right, but you can get a DJ, a right. photographer, a personal <laughs> trainer. Karate lessons. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> So you just go to their website, you type in the service and your zip code, right. and then they ask you specific questions about what you actually want We're, done. And what's interesting, it's very detailed. Right. So you're really qualifying what the job is and who the pro is. That's well, I was looking out. at this for my parents for okay. snow removal, because right. yeah, they're smart. old and I don't right. want to do it. <laughs> Um, so I typed in snow removal, their zip code, it right. asked when, how often, how big of an area, yeah. if I have my own equipment. Right, right. So you're actually getting the right person for the job that you want done. Yeah. Smart. And then you're going to get up to five different bids. They're going to give you the price. And then you get the profile of the pro. So you're going to know their background. Right, if they're licensed. R right, right, whether they've ever done <laughs> the karate lessons before. Right. You're going to get reviews from people who have really mm -hmm. used them. So, it's it, yeah, it's a very interesting site. What's Thumb the site? It's thumbtack.com. So check it out. Back to circular saws. <laughs> So with a circular saw, the blade is actually spinning up, so it's designed to pull up through the wood as you're huh. cutting to give you more control. If it were spinning the other direction, it would be pulling you forward, and you wouldn't have as much control. <laughs> It'd be like a ride. So to get the cleanest cut of material, if you have a finished face, so one good face, or the face that's going to be exposed, you'd want to cut the face down oh. and then use a blade that's recommended for the material. So generally when you buy a circular saw, it's going to come with a blade probably 18 to 24 teeth per right. inch. And that's TPI you're going to see marked on these. Mm -hmm. They're generally going to give you a coarse cut for cleaner cuts. And depending on the material, you might use a saw blade with 50 or 60 teeth right. per inch. So look at the label and match the blade to your material. That's kind of the key. So it'll say metal or wood or whatever. Right, or, right. or plywood or clean cuts right. or cross cut, rip cut. For You can also put painter's tape over the face side and cut through that actually helps keep the wood from splintering. It's, oh. it's interesting when you see videos of people using tape where they're cutting through mm -hmm. compared to none, there is less splintering. 
That's which is interesting. interesting. You can also use a utility knife to score the line, and that helps. And then some pros recommending scoring the top of the material if you have two sides with a finished surface like a door. Mm -hmm. So one technique is to adjust the blade so only an eighth of an inch or less of the blade is just coming past the shoe and then you're gonna score the top side. Let's say we're working on a door. You're gonna score the top side and just so you're creating that little that groove. little rip groove and then you're gonna lower your blade so it goes all the way through by an eighth of an inch and that's going to create less splintering as it comes up through that groove. Oh, okay. Yeah, so very interesting. You never want to use a dull blade. And some How do you of know the, if it's dull? So it's going to start to slow down the RPMs. You're going to hear them start to slow down. It'll, it'll actually cause it to start smoking the, the wood. It'll turn black. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really so if tried to... catch things on fire, it's time to change your blade. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> a couple of the main types are rip cut. So RIP, this is when you're cutting along the grain. And these blades are going to have less teeth and larger gullets. What is that? The... So, so the gullet is that space between the teeth, and this is what's removing the sawdust and okay. chips and throwing it out the back chute of your circular saw. A cross-cut blade is designed to cut across the grain, and these have more teeth and smaller gullets, and you're going to be moving a little slower as mm -hmm. you're going through the wood. Plywood blades have very fine teeth. You're going to get a cleaner cut. You're going to see combination or all-purpose. So this is for a variety of cuts where you don't care about a smooth finish, right. like cutting through 2x4s and 2x6s. And then with the like a 2 by lumber, dimensional lumber, you want a thin, kerf, carbide-tipped combination blade. And what does all those words mean? Well, it's, well, <laughs> well, a thin, car, well, thin kerf, you're going to get a very thin cut line. Okay. It's carbide-tip, so it's going to last very long, and it's also going to cut through fast. Okay. So that's a good one to have. <laughs> and you're going to have a lot of specialized blades so take your time while you're looking at blades and picking them because you can get them for paneling veneers plywood laminates plastic so metal, basically brick. match the material to <laughs> right the blade. exactly and you're going to see some with all of these slots through it and mm -hmm. these are expansion slots so it actually helps keep the blade cool and prevents it from warping and Setting stuff on fire. Right, right, exactly. Some of the top rated blades, the Diablo blades, so D-I-A-B-L-O, DeWalt, and Bosch, B-O-S-C-H, were highly rated. Well, I think you should spell DeWalt. Just to the capital D-E, capital W-A-L-T. <laughs> and then I would check the blade size and the arbor size, because depending on the circular saw you buy, most of your circular saws are going to be seven and a quarter inch blade, it's going to have a 5 eighths inch arbor. Mm -hmm. Almost all worm drives have a diamond-shaped arbor. Interesting. And, and what's wild with that is there's a lot of combination blades. So it'll have a circle in the center for, right. a, for a standard circular saw. And then you'll see the outline of a diamond. And you just take a hammer and you hit it. And it knocks that out. Oh, and that, exciting. And, and it has the diamond shape. And then for your smaller circular saws, like the 5 and a half inch or 6 inch circular saws, they're going to have a half inch arbor. So you need to match the size of the blade, and the size of the arbor. When you're replacing a blade, you want to make sure that you always unplug it or remove the battery. You're going to pull up the blade guard, and you're going to have a wrench that comes with it, and it's either going to have either a hex screw or it's going to have like an Allen screw. So and most the, of these come in like a tool bag or in a box, right, the circular saws? Well, I like I, I, I prefer the bags or a case. Like if right. you buy one and, and they Remember we were doing a project at my dad's house? Okay. And you use their circular saw, and right. he's got the really nice case, right. and you and my dad couldn't figure out how to put it back in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah, it, it, it stood there for like yeah. 10 minutes. And it's, like, it's like a circle and a <laughs> square square hole, yeah. It was... And like I came up and did it right away. <laughs> oh, good memories. <laughs> yeah, so get a bag. It's <laughs> yeah. much, easier to, much easier to put in there. <laughs> and when you're changing the blade, some of the older ones didn't have locks. So I would look for a circular saw that has a locking mechanism that's going to hold that blade in place so it's very easy to you know loosen that nut and then tighten again. And you never want to over-tighten that screw or the nut. You want to just snug it down. Well, my and point then, with like bringing up the bag in the box thing okay. was that you can keep all this kind of stuff together. Yeah, because you have you're you're going to want to have extra blades right. and you know like the wrench. Mm -hmm. You you might have a little jig that you're using or right. your speed square. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I really like having a case or a bag. And with this, if you have an older model or if you bought maybe a, a less expensive one and you don't have the locking mechanism to lock the blade while you're changing it. 
then one tip is just to pull the blade guard up and drop it down a piece of scrap lumber and okay. hold on to it, and that's going to keep the blade from turning <laughs> yeah. while you unscrew the, the nut. Make sure you're wearing eye protection. You want impact-resistant goggles, and check the chip chute behind the blade to see where it points and how you're going to be primarily holding on to it. So if you're right-handed or left-handed, mm -hmm. sometimes where that chute is, where all the chips come out, is really annoying if it's like... You should get an apron. <laughs> there you go. And I would, at the store, you know, feel the handle, see how it feels, feel the weight of it, mm -hmm. see where the grips are. Milwaukee has an interesting circular saw. It has an adjustable handle for more oh. comfort, so it fits, you know, how That's you normally nice. stand. And then some saws have a dust chute adapter, mm -hmm. so you can connect this to a wet dry vac to collect the dust chips. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that on DeWalt, Bosch, and Makita. And Makita has an interesting corded, this is a kind of a small four inch circular saw, oh. and this has a built in dust collector, so it has a little bin behind the blade. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so that, that, I thought that was pretty slick, especially if you're just doing small projects, right. just, you know, two by fours and things. And if your circular saw is over 85 decibels, you want to make sure that you're wearing hearing protection. Since you can never find the earplugs when we needed them, right. we got those safety glasses from Bench Dog that have the earplugs Right, with yeah. Them yeah, those are cool. So they go attached to them if you can't lose them. And they go over prescription glasses, right. so I can wear them right over my glasses. And then the earplugs are built right into the frame. Yeah, so that, nice. Yeah, very smart. And another thing for safety, I would look for trigger locks on your circular saw. A laser guide is really nice on a lot of the new ones, especially if you don't use a circular saw a lot. Mm -hmm. A laser comes out the front, and it puts a beam all the way down your work so you can really line up where that blade is going to go. It's like Space Age. <laughs> it's super cool. You can get a blower to blow dust off your line so oh. it blows in, in front. And then bevel stops for your angle settings. So this locks in easy at the most popular angles because not only can you adjust the depth of the blade, but you can adjust it to, let's say, a 45-degree angle oh. that you're going through your material. You can get indicator lights on the power cord itself to know when it's plugged in. And then you can also purchase extension cords or plugs that mm -hmm. have an indicator light to know when you have the power on. Right. And, and all this type of stuff, you know, make sure that with the power tools, when you're finished making your cuts and you're not near the saw, I would always unplug it right. just in case somebody picks it up and grabs it. That's what's nice about having that light. Always match your extension cord to the amps. If you use an underpowered cord, it's going to shorten the life of your tool. Mm -hmm. And for cordless, keep your batteries charged between uses and you want to store your batteries out of extreme heat or cold. And when you're looking at circular saws, the higher the amp, the more power it's going to have, and it's going to last longer, too. Right. So, so the 13 to 15 amp range is your more powerful circular saws. Is this with, something like with drills that if you're not going to use it that often, you should get a corded circular saw instead I, I, of a I cordless? Would. Yeah, because with a, with a if you have a cordless saw and you you only are going to use this once a year right, or, or less, it the battery is... 10 years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, your battery is going to be junk, and the right. batteries are expensive right. because the batteries are designed to be kept charged between use, and the more you use it, believe it or not, you're going to get longer life out of your batteries. And with the cordless, the higher volts, 18 volts and higher, you're going to get the most power mm -hmm. depending on the work you're going through. Blow off the dust from your blade cover and motor housing occasionally and check. If you have an electric circular saw and it has brushes, then you want to check them every what are once the in a while. So this is the brushes. It's, it's almost like a little small black square. It has a spring and wires and a contact on top of it. So it doesn't and, look like a brush? No. And this allows the electricity to flow between the stationary wires from your switch to the rotating parts of the motor. So just very interesting. And to replace these, you're, you're going to check it regularly. So maybe once, it depends on how much you use them. Right. And if you use it a lot, as it gets down to about a quarter inch, there's going to be a line on there too. You're going to want, and, and if one is low and the other one still looks good, right. you still want to replace them both <laughs> at the same time. So there's going to be a little cap. You're going to unscrew that cap. You're going to pull this brush out, check it and then run down to the hardware store. You want to match it up exactly, and then you're going to put it back so in. So they come in different sizes? Yes. Of and, course. And now you're going to see new motors that are cordless or, or uh, brushless. Mm -hmm. And some of these cordless, brushless motors are going to be much more powerful and efficient. They're going to be lighter. They're going to run cooler. But right now they're a little more expensive hmm. than the ones with brushes. 
If you have a worm drive, most manufacturers recommend that you change the oil once a year. So you're going to unplug your saw, you're going to remove the blade, you're going to remove this plug, and you just drain out the old oil. You want to make sure that you're using a worm drive oil. So this is a gear oil that's anti-foam, it's high pressure, it's high speed, it's a 90W. You never want to use traditional motor oil, and if you have a foaming oil in there, it can actually blow out your seals. Oh. So you need to make sure you get the right type. Two of the top rated are from Skill and Bosch. And then once you fill it, generally you're going to fill it to the bottom threads where you're screwing in your plug. Some of them have a dipstick, some of them don't. Okay. But the key thing is just get it to the bottom threads of that plug. Some of the top rated circular saws, Bosch, the Makita Magnesium, DeWalt, the Skill Magnesium 77, and Milwaukee. And these are all seven and a quarter, they all use a seven and a quarter inch blade. Okay. A, a smaller circular saw that uses a six and a half inch blade that was rated very high is the Rigid Fuego, R-I-D-G-I-D. -I and then the top rated cordless, the Milwaukee 18 volt, DeWalt, and Makita. And then if you're looking for just a compact circular saw, they've got a couple with a four and a half inch blade. So Rockwell mm -hmm. was highly rated and the Works, W-O-R-X. Do you have anything else to add? Because I cannot believe we've talked this long about circular <laughs> saws. I would say for projects around the house, a lightweight, inexpensive corded sidewinder is a good choice. And it's going to last you a lifetime. If you plan on doing a lot of remodeling around the house, finishing basements, building decks, consider a worm drive. But I would run to the store and feel the weight and the comfort. Check it, it out. Depends on where you are in the country. <laughs> right, right. Match the blade to your project. Never use a dull blade. I would always have backup blades, especially if you're doing big projects. Mm -hmm. And then if circular saws scare you for your projects, just contact somebody at thumbtack.com. Oh, that was funny. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, the Google Play Music app, and iHeartRadio. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. If you want to contact us, you can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.